Welcome to another episode of Raquel and Kelly Sports Talk Questions. And guess what? We're totally changing it up this week. We are not, in fact, talking about any high school sports. We're going to talk about something that as parents, we don't like to happen to our kids, which is common sports injuries. Kids get hurt, and that's just part of the game. So what we're going to do today is we are going to be talking about concussions, which is a very important conversation. And then we're going to be talking about the things that happen to your ankles and your knees and your muscles and strains and sprains and so on. And then we're going to finish the episode with some athletes who unfortunately have dealt with some injuries um, this season. So we're going to talk with them about how they're doing. So I'm going to get Kelly to do our introductions. We're going to start with the crew from the concussion clinic. Hi everyone. So this week we are joined by Dr. Joe Albert and Dr. Paul Merlino, both from the Sioux Concussion Clinic. And what we're gonna do is we're just gonna dive right in. We have a number of questions for them and lots of conversation to look forward to. So our very first question, as basic as it seems, is what is a concussion? Okay, all right, so Dr. Merlino here uh, from Sioux Concussion Clinic. So what is a concussion? Of course, at the most basic level, it's an injury to your brain, right? But more than that, it's an acceleration injury to your brain. So you take a hit, your head moves very quickly, Along with it, your brain moves very quickly and then decelerates very quickly, okay? So if you can imagine that, it's happening inside your skull. And what happens is sort of a shearing type of injury to the nerves in your brain, okay? So it's not a permanent injury. There's not permanent damage that happens. But your brain sort of jiggles as jello would on a plate, okay? And what it causes is like a depolarization event. That's like an electrical storm that happens in your brain. So a bunch of the nerves in your brain discharge, and then you get this crash in energy. And that's why a lot of people who get concussions feel awful right after. And then you get the typical symptoms that come on with it. But at its root, it's an acceleration and then a deceleration of the brain. So it's not that the brain hits the side of your skull and causes okay. a bruise. It's acceleration, deceleration, and then the, the consequent symptoms after that. Okay, I'm already with a question that's not on the list. <laughs> um, here we go. Here we go, just tell me to stop. But, um, so a concussion is often caused, we think of it as somebody smacking their head on something, right? But what, you, but what I'm thinking is, can it just be caused by like a rapid movement of your head so you didn't actually hit anything, but right. your head, I'm thinking like, I don't know if whiplash is the right word, yes. right? Like, Absolutely. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. So in football, yeah. in football or hockey, you can take a body shot yes. and your head can whip back quickly and not hit anything and still suffer a concussion. It's just the speed in which your head oh, accelerates okay. and okay. then decelerates quickly. Mm -hmm. That's all you need. Now, most common is impact to the head because that will cause the head to accelerate quickly, but it doesn't need to be a head impact to have a concussion. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We're already learning a lot. <laughs> all right. So... What then signs and symptoms are we looking for? Because you can bump your head and not have a concussion. That can happen, of course, right? Yeah. But so what are the signs and symptoms that you would look for? Or what would a parent even, you know, later that day after uh, a practice or something like, what are they looking for to say this might be a concussion? Okay, Dr. Albert here. So when you hit your head and, and, and injure your brain, your brain controls everything in your body. So you do have any possible symptom could come because the brain does everything for your body but we do have a list of common symptoms that we ask for and you don't need every one of these symptoms to say you have a concussion but any one of these symptoms is present with a concussion typically and there's a common list of 22 symptoms okay. and we oh, ask wow. we ask this for every patient that comes in and we look at these 22 all the time all right so i'm going to read that list really clear for you okay so we have a loss of consciousness and key to that is more than 90% of all concussions, there is no loss of consciousness. This is just one possible symptom. Okay, we have headaches or pressure in the head, neck pain, dizziness or vertigo, nausea or vomiting, blurry vision, uh, feeling off balance, feeling tired, fatigued, uh, drowsy or not having energy, uh, feeling foggy or not thinking clearly. You know, you're like you're just in a fog. You just don't feel right. Uh, more emotional, more irritable, uh, nervous, anxious sensitive to light, sensitive to noise, uh, difficulty concentrating, difficulty reading, uh, difficulty remembering, confusion, and sleep troubles, whether falling asleep or sleeping too much. Oh, based on that, I might have that. <laughs> 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 only after, only yeah. after mechanism of injury. <laughs> okay, then I don't know if you can Okay, now, I, I have a question. Yeah. Out of those symptoms, how many of them would you say 
fall into more sort of the normal category? Because that's a lot of symptoms. Yes. Someone could have them all. You said somebody can only have a few of them. Are there any that would be more prevalent than others? You know, we've seen them all. Okay. And many patients, we see nearly all of them. Mm -hmm. But if I'm going to say more common, most common, you're going to see neck pain, headache, dizziness. Mm -hmm. That tends to be the most common things we see. Um, but you don't, again, you don't need all of them. When it comes to diagnosing a concussion, we follow a very basic rule. Was there a mechanism of injury that makes sense? And is there a symptom? Okay. Okay. That's all it takes. We don't need 22 symptoms. Right. Did right. you get hit hard? And do you have a symptom? Yeah, so that goes to what parents or coaches should do. If you have a mechanism of injury plus a symptom, then you play it safe. Always. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. And when we're saying headache on that list, are we talking just like I'm going to take a Tylenol? Or is it typically excruciating? It, no. it doesn't any any kind of headache any after head. the injury. After, yeah, the, after injury. the mechanism. Any type of headache is, is what you're going to see. Yeah. Now, if this is an excruciating headache where you're going to feel like, okay, I got hit with a baseball bat kind of headache. That's a different story. That's where we want when you go see the emergency room. Exactly. Okay. Right? Yeah. But if you have a headache, as opposed to excruciating head pain, right. two differences. Okay. Right? You have excruciating head pain, like someone just hit me with a bat, I'm probably going to send you down and get that checked. Mm -hmm. okay. So the headache typically is going to be, you know, a standard headache, maybe mm -hmm. a little more than a usual headache for sure. But not, not incapacitating. Correct. Yeah. Typically not incapacitating. Unless you're not used to headaches and you don't like any headache whatsoever. Right. But yeah. 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 And it's hard to gauge that for someone. It so is. that's why we say you have a headache after a hit, call it a concussion until you're told otherwise. Until you're told otherwise. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, it looks like our next question is Does a concussion require medical intervention every time? Um, the simple answer to that is not so simple. So concussions are best managed. Um, through a multi-medical professional approach. The more people are, that are helping you, the better, because there are different angles to look at this. Now, most concussions don't need an emergency room visit, okay? But there's a couple of things we look for that would warrant an okay. emergency room visit, and we have a list of those, too. We have a list of those? All yes. Right. Okay. Let's do this. So, after a mechanism of injury, if you see any of these, we tend to send to the emergency room, okay. all right? So extreme drowsiness. So there's a difference between I'm a little tired and I can barely keep my eyes open and stand up. I'm, I'm going down. That's different, okay? Loss of consciousness more than 30 seconds or can't be woken up. Um, multiple episodes of vomiting. So we may have one, and one is pretty common. Right. If you're having more than one, we recommend emergency room visit. Okay. okay? Um, if this injury happened while well intoxicated, because you can't assess how, mm -hmm. how hard this might have been, um, if you're having a lot of trouble with memory at the time, a lot of short-term memory loss, you can't, you don't know where you are, what's going on, where you, why am I here? That's another one. Seizures, um, increase, increasing confusion. You start really getting lost. All right. Um, really, so bad headache. We already mentioned that. So mm -hmm. severe headache. Um, black eyes, bruising in the face. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you get hit anywhere and you start getting black eyes, bruising in the face, that could could uh, signify further damage to the brain. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, very, very unsteady. Can't quite walk, right? Um, severe, dangerous mechanism of injury. Fall down the stairs, car accident, something more severe than sports, but we're into sports right now. Slurring speech, numbness, arms and legs, um, severe neck pain, uh, severe double vision, and again, oh, seizures was on my list twice. Okay. So we're looking for some pretty serious right. symptoms here to go to the ER. Yeah. All right. Um, Again, when you come to see us, we're going to assess at the time as well. If an ER visit is, is necessary, we're going to send you that way. Right? Yeah, we're not going to treat this without. As a parent, I think also go with your gut. Like if you think something is very wrong, then yeah. go to the emergency go. room. Yeah. Yes, go immediately. No yeah. harm. No harm. Yeah, you, right. What happens, yeah. you go to the emergency room, they tell you it's not severe. That's right. Yeah. Great. Right. <laughs> That's what I wanted to hear. Yeah. Right? Yeah, agreed. I, go ahead. <laughs> I just want to jump ahead a couple of questions and kind of go out of, out of order here, but... Um, does the clinic require a referral from a doctor? So how would an athlete come to you guys? Would you uh, no referral required. Okay. You can come in, just call our office and book an appointment. We get quite a few referrals from medical doctors because of the scenario we were just talking about. You go to eMERGE, they say right. you have a concussion. Okay, go to the concussion clinic, they'll take you through the protocol. But you don't need that referral. You can just call us and book an appointment. Okay. 
a cold call like that. So okay. you don't yeah. have to go to Emerge and get the referral. You don't have to. No. Appointment. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. So you've already you've used this word. I've heard you mention it. Um, what is concussion protocol? It's something I hear a lot, but I don't necessarily know exactly what it entails. Right. So if you come in and you're diagnosed with a concussion, especially an acute concussion, so within the last two weeks is considered acute. So the, and chronic would be longer than two weeks, and that's handled differently. But we have a protocol that we take our patients through to ensure that we get them to full recovery. And so initially, it's a period of rest. So we're trying to reduce your symptoms initially. We're trying to bring those constellations of symptoms down. And then it's a gradual reintroduction into their life. So we have a return to learn and then a return to play section. Or if you're not a student, return to work, return to play. And it's a series of steps. So first we introduce, say we were talking about a student. First we would in make sure a symptom free at home. Then we would introduce half day of school. If half day of school goes well, you go to full day of school. If either of those steps don't go well, the brain is telling you we're not there yet. So we bring you back down and then we try again. Once we get to a full day of school with no symptoms, usually takes about one week to get there. We do what's called a treadmill test on you. So it's an exertion test. We put you on the treadmill, we have you walking, we're slowly inclining the treadmill and we see how you, your body reacts to that. We're monitoring your heart rate. It's kind of like a stress test. If you pass that, that clears you to go back into your sport in a very similar graduated step-by-step -step way. So your first practice, and it would only be practices at this point, you wouldn't have any gameplay. Your first practice would be a skills-based practice, no contact. Your second would be a little bit quicker, still no contact. We're trying to get three practices in there before, if you're a higher level athlete, we bring you back in for a physical exertion test. In this one, it's a very difficult physical test. We're gonna put your body through what it goes through during a game. Mm -hmm. If you can pass that, then we're usually pretty confident. Now, if you have a baseline test with us, which would be done prior to the concussion, or usually at the beginning of the season, we would retest you then for your baseline and make sure you're back to your normal. Okay. So it's at that point, and that whole process takes two to four weeks, depending on, depending on the athlete, depending on the person and how they're progressing through. But basically, we're not progressing you to the next stage until you have this stage figured out. So that's concussion protocol. So it's a series of steps we take you through. Okay, which actually answered the next question, which is when is someone cleared for sports? <clears throat> right. And you said they have to pass the levels. That's right. And, yeah. and, and for our, like our higher level athletes, so we're talking you know, junior hockey or collegiate level, even high school at like the football level, we take you to that exertion test. If you're just a leisure athlete, you know, you're just playing for fun, then we usually don't do that exertion test on you. It's a very, very demanding physical test. But yeah, it is the, it is the exertion test that will clear you. Then we want to see usually one full speed practice, and then you're cleared for gameplay. Okay. And what would have an athlete have a baseline with you? Like if they didn't have a concussion or like how would they get a baseline? Because I'm assuming if they're an athlete, maybe they could pass the exertion test or they're... Right. What if they couldn't? The, what Just normally. So the baseline isn't the exertion test. So the baseline basically is, is a series of tasks that we, we kind of test the brain through okay. to see what your normal is. So this is done early okay. in the season to see what that player's normal is. And it's a number of tests. It's memory, it's, it's recall, it's reflexes, it's balance. It's a lot of little tests. So what we're trying to do is get a baseline of what you are normal. Right. Then, once we get you through the protocol, we're pretty confident you're healed. Then we make you do that physical test. And like, well, good, no brain problems. Now... Let's go back and redo the baseline. It should at least look the same as it was before so that we know you're back to normal. So we're looking for, for variances on that baseline that don't make sense from your normal. And then we'd say, okay, well, you feel good, but something's still off here, so we're not ready to get you back yet. Okay. We need that to look the same as it was before. Mm -hmm. So that's what the baseline's about. So some teams will set that up. They'll set that up with our clinic, and they'll okay. do it as a team. That's what I was wondering. Yeah. How did, yeah. yeah. And it so, needs to be done, like, usually at the beginning of the season. Right. Because if you're concussed without a baseline, it's useless. Like, you need it done before like like and at the event of an injury. should have a baseline. Yeah. It, it really hurts. Help. Yeah. It yeah. really it helps It doesn't hurt to you. have a baseline yeah. test. Right? There's a lot of, of ongoing research on the overall validity of baselines, but overall, there's no harm in getting one done. No. And having another tool 
to right. make sure we get you back a little safer, okay. right? That's what we want is to get someone cleared when we're sure it's safe, right? Because right? if we can get through a concussion and get through it properly, then your brain will heal and it's like it never had one. Okay. It's if you don't go through the steps properly, you can set yourself up for long-term problems. So if right. we're confident and we get you through this properly, you got a good healed brain, you're ready to roll. Hmm. Which does kind of lead me to the to the another question that we have is what happens with repeat concussions? Right. And that's the whole purpose of the concussion protocol is to avoid getting your head hit while you're healing from the current concussion. Okay. So that's where the problems of concussion come into play. So like uh, Dr. Albert just said, if you go through protocol and you go all the way to the end, your brain is healed. And there's, you have no more likely to get the next concussion than you were this one. But it's when you go back too soon, you get your head hit again before you've recovered. Now we have a bigger problem on our hands. So okay. it's a worse concussion. It takes longer to heal. If that happens two times in a season, we start talking about ending the season for the athlete. If it happens three times in a season, we start talking about ending the sport for the athlete because it's the second impact that's the problem. And it can lead to very serious problems. That's why Rowan's law was put into place. That was a second impact where unfortunately the poor girl passed away, right? Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. that's a very important point. And the reason we take you through concussion protocol is to avoid the second hit. That's what we don't want. That's what we're telling every patient that comes through. Do not hit your head while we're going through this process. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. We have one more question, yeah. which is, what do coaches need to know about concussions? And just in general, do you know, are high school coaches going through concussion training? I work at Ogo University, and I do know that it's taken very seriously at the varsity level, and I do know that the everyone in varsity is well aware of concussion protocol and the training that needs to go into it. But is that happening to your knowledge at the high school level? So what do coaches need to know about concussions? And then also what are, what's going on with training about concussions? Well, I can't speak for every sport, okay. but I do know, for example, in hockey, mm-hmm. um, part of being a coach and part of the little courses you need to take, they do discuss Rowan's Law and concussion in there. Okay. Right? And the coach's responsibility to recognize that there is a potential for a concussion and to have that player assessed before they let them play again. Okay. okay, so that's the real thing. So what do coaches need to know? We like to, again, keep it simple, and we've all heard this before, is when in doubt, sit them out. Okay. Right? Yeah. If you think something may be off as a coach, that guy got hit and he's, he's just, something's not right and I'm not confident with my medical skills, that's a concussion until somebody tells me it's not. Right, so you do not let that player come back to any team function until you've been told that's not a concussion or they are cleared to play. Okay. So what does a coach need to know? Did something look like it made sense out there? A mechanism of injury, like we said. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's simple. And is that, that player coming off with a symptom? Right, any one of those possible symptoms we listed, does something not seem right? Are they a little off? Right, if that's the case, I'd call out a concussion. Let's go see the concussion clinic the next day. You're not coming back to play until you're told you're not. Yeah, it's uh, if you're unsure, set them out. Right. Like there's, yeah. you know, it could be borderline. You're not sure. Well, that's still enough to say should right. at least sit out this game and get assessed. Yeah. And we know that there's going to be athletes that are going to say, I'm fine. Mm. And that was what I was just going to ask. Like, do you fine. know when they're not telling you the truth? Like, it's the biggest problem on the sideline. Yeah. 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 Without, without some sort of medical training or knowledge, it would be very hard to notice. Yeah. It would be very hard for me to tell you how to assess a patient's eyes and see what you're looking for. So you do have to put some trust into the player. Mm -hmm. But that goes with knowing your players. You know, and if you can just look in someone's eyes, and you're like, I'm not that, like, you're not looking (laughs) like, just just call it one, right? Because the risk of that second impact Uh is, it can be severe, right? It has led to death. Not super common, but it can. So why take that chance in youth sports? Mm-hmm. Let's just make sure. Right. Are the athletes signing any kind of contract with you guys once they enter the clinic for the protocol? Or? There's no contract to sign. Obviously, we I mean, give them we give crazy, them a great right? deal of education, yeah. and we explain a lot. We draw graphs, and we really explain what happens if they get hit again and what we're looking for and why we're bringing them in to do things. Mm-hmm. So there's a great explanation there. And when we discuss some of the possible negative effects that could come of it, it's usually not hard to get them to buy in. Okay. 
Right. Right. Like I said, if we follow that procedure, you're healed and it's fine. If we get another impact within that range, that could mean missing a whole season. So it tends to be easy to tell a player, look, you're going to miss a few weeks or do you want to take a chance and miss a whole season? Yeah. And, and ultimately, like we're fans of sport. We love sports <laughs> and we hate telling the athletes that they have to sit out. But what our goal is, is to is to get them better in the shortest amount of time that's safe to do so. Right. And research tells us it takes somewhere around two and a half to four weeks for your brain to heal from a concussion. So even if you're symptom free at seven days, your yeah. brain is still healing at that point. So what we're trying to do is like in the safest period of time, with the exertion tests, putting your body through, making sure there's no symptoms as we go along, at least we're gonna leave, we're gonna, you're gonna sit out for the shortest period of time that we think is safe. And then if you're, if you're sent back too soon, you get that second impact, now you're out longer, right? right? Now it's a more challenging scenario. And it's going to impact other areas of your life. Absolutely. Significantly. Yeah. Significantly. Significantly. Yes. Like it isn't just the sport. Right. So, yeah. I'm like, I can't believe we're, we're <laughs> over time. Like, wow. There's always so much to learn, Kelly. I know, I know. Like, there's so much to <laughs> learn. We're starting at nothing. Well, because we're at ground zero. So, I mean, everything is, we're always learning. Um, so why don't one of you just tell us how to get in contact with you at the concussion clinic, um, where to find you, how to get in touch with you, uh, even a quick website, anything, before we wrap up. Okay. Um, we put them on the spot with this one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can definitely call us at any time. Here, I'll give the phone number. I brought a card. So 705-574-4325, and you can call that anytime to, to book a concussion. You can email us, sueconcussionclinic, all lowercase, at gmail.com. And you're so, S-O-O? -O nope, nope, S-A-U-L-T. Okay. Um, we do have a website. It's on our, it's called am-chiropractic.com, and there's a Sue Concussion tab on that website. And you can actually book online on that okay. on that website. So you can click the book and online. If all those fails, just Google Sue Concussion Clinic. <laughs> yes, and, and it'll it. it'll show up. Yeah. Thank you so much for giving us some time. And um, I mean, I knew what a concussion was. I thought, but I didn't know everything. When I heard your brain is jello, I look <laughs> on my face. <laughs> yeah. So thank you very much. I feel like that was really really educational, and I really hope that a lot of parents and coaches tune in. To, to learn a little bit more and to really understand that it isn't something that, oh, sit out for a day or two and you're fine. I admit I've probably had that attitude a little bit, which I will no longer have. Um, so thank you very much for teaching us and sharing your knowledge with us. Absolutely, happy to share. Yeah, thanks for thank having you. us. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, our next guest is Dr. Stephen Scott, local chiropractor, and we're gonna cover some of the common injuries that students face such as things like ankle injuries, knees, muscles, that kind of stuff. So we're gonna get right into it. And we're gonna start with, I said, let's go bottom up. Sounds good. I always think of the most common sports injuries are ankles and knees. That's what I tend to think of. I know concussion and other things, but so let's start right at the bottom. And what are the common sports injuries that, um, that athletes encounter with ankles and knees? And I'm going to let you just take it away, Dr. Scott. Boy, there's so much to go with there. So, like, an, uh, an ankle sprain is probably lower limb would be most common. It depends on the sport, though. In a sport like hockey, where the foot is secured in a skate, mm, you know, point. ankle injuries are pretty rare. In a sport like volleyball or basketball, where their, you know, their ankles are exposed and you're jumping and landing on feet and turning, it's, it's pretty common. So it's very sport-specific. Um, but, like, ankle sprains would be probably, you know, the number one. Maybe knee sprain would be really, really common. Achilles injuries, um, and then certainly things like like broken toes and and contusions and muscle tears and that sort of stuff. So what are we what are we think when you say an ankle sprain, strain sprain? What, huh. So what has happened? So I'll quickly differentiate the two. So sprain okay, and strain yes. are different things. Yes. So uh, generally speaking, in in very broad terms, a sprain is a joint, and joint structures. Strain is muscle. So strain is muscle tendons, uh, sprain is uh, joint capsule, ligaments, cartilage, um, that sort of stuff in the, in the joint itself. So they're, they're different, often used incorrectly, but they're, yes. they're very different. Okay. So when somebody, and I'm using air quotes, which my listeners can't see, but when somebody rolls their ankle. Right. Right. Okay. So what's happening? What, what are, 
what are we looking for where it's going to be a problem? Because you can roll your ankle and just carry on. Right, and a lot of times you do. You'll roll your ankle, you kind of catch yourself. And by roll your ankle, the 98% the of them are an inversion sprain where you roll in. Rolling the other way is really uncommon. The ligaments okay, yeah. are, are much stronger on one side of the ankle than the other. So you typically roll the ankle in. A lot of times you kind of catch yourself and can kind of pull back before you get to a certain point of injury. Um, it's where you roll and you go beyond what the ligament is, is designed for. So you tear it. It's, it's oh, okay. a, a, a microscopic tear. And both sprains and strains have degrees, degrees of severity. Um, there's a few ways to classify them, but one, two, three. So mild, medium, and complete. Mm -hmm. So you pull something too far, you get a minor tear, you've got a sprain. Okay. So now, what are we looking at for um, general treatment? And again, obviously go to a medical doctor and like go to the ER if it's really, really bad, but just kind of like I rolled my ankle in practice, it's not feeling so good. Right, so the, the big concern is a fracture because a fracture would okay. be treated very differently than anything else and you can fracture with the same type of injury. So if you're at all worried about that, like they were talking about with the concussion thing, if you're worried at all, go to the hospital. Go. Get an exactly. x-ray, rule it go out. Right. Yeah. Once we know for sure it's not a fracture, then we can go ahead and treat it. Um, there's been a bit of a change over the last little while about the, uh, the approach of uh, ice. Mm -hmm. And historically, we would push ice, the whole rest ice yes. compression yes. elevation thing. Um, that's been debunked a little. Okay. Um, it's, it's a lot more controversial now that it was. Research shows that ice is actually not beneficial. It might actually hinder the process, that the inflammatory response that ice stops is actually beneficial to healing. So the latest oh. research is to not ice an acute injury. Um, it's very hard to get our heads around. I still, if, if I hurt something on myself, I'm, I'm probably going to grab an ice pack anyway, right. even though I've yeah. read the research. So yeah. um, the elevation, rest, um, compression to a degree are still um, the, the big ones for now. Right. And when would somebody, okay, so in, with concussions, we talked a lot about clear, right? You're clear to go. So let's say somebody, basketball court, volleyball, rolled their ankle. So you said they've stretched out that ligament, right? Right. At what point is it safe to say you can go back? No pain or no, I'm just going to wrap it up a little pain, push through the pain. Because you know how we, a lot of times, we oh, just push through the pain, you're yeah. fine. Right. So, I mean, as a healthcare professional, I'm not really wild about the whole play through the pain that, thing. Yeah. Um, the big difference between, say, uh, like an ankle sprain and when they were talking about concussions earlier, yeah. um, the, the long-term bad things that can happen from a concussion are so much worse than the other stuff. So mm -hmm. you, you have to err way more on the side of caution when it's the head that's involved. Uh -huh. um, for the most part, if the kid says they can play on something, it's, it's probably okay to let them try. Um, you, can, you can have the trainer um, tape them up. Um, you know, they try and run around on the side, walk, run, if they feel like they can try. You, you'll often let them give it a whirl. Um, you know, the, the risk is there. A partial injury can become a more severe injury if you, you know, hurt it more. But, you know, you're not probably still talking about lifetime consequence. So you're, okay. you're more likely to give the, the player the benefit of the doubt and let them try it. Um, and it's situational as well. If it's, okay. you know, the second game of the season and, you know, fun hockey, sit out. It's not worth it. If it's, right. the, you know, right. the playoffs and you're talking, you know, a AAA Greyhound, they're going to want to go back in. You're probably going to let them. So you, you have to sort of work with the athlete a bit and, and give them a bit of the benefit of the doubt. Okay. So we talked about ice and we talked about heat, but when should you elevate? So generally speaking, any acute injury now, you still elevate. It keeps the swelling down. Um, it's, it's a good idea with, with rest. Um, and by elevate, they mean above the level of the heart. So like if you're okay. sitting upright and putting your foot on like a bench, oh, don't yeah. so you need to really It has right. to be up. So oh. for a lower in leg um, injuries, the easiest way to do it by far is to have the athlete lay on a couch, throw their leg up on the back of the couch, and oh, it'll drain high. down. Yeah, oh. or in bed, a couple of pillows when they're yeah. laying down at night. Okay. It's just above the level of the heart. That's what mm -hmm. you're trying to, to, to drain, using gravity, right? So right. trying to get it to drain downwards. I think the fact that you just said sitting up with your foot propped up is not having it elevated. Right. No. It might be yeah. comfortable, but it's not really accomplished. Right. Like, yeah. yeah, that's a great piece of advice. Like, cause above the heart. Above the heart, yeah. Yeah. Okay, I like it. Okay, so muscles. So I'm thinking things like, pulling a muscle, right? Oh, I pulled a muscle. Again, what does that even mean? So it would be a type muscle? of strain. So any any okay. time where you damage the muscle, you're talking a strain. Um, you know, a, the muscles are made up of millions of, of fibers. Uh, a strain is damage, tearing of a portion of those fibers. So a small number of fibers would be a mild, uh, mild strain. Sorry, mild strain. Uh, a greater degree would be a more kind of moderate strain. And then a complete tear would be 
foot, like it sounds. You've torn the muscle or the tendon. So uh -huh. those are sort of the, the ranges. But it's 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 the you think of a muscle almost like a like a braided rope that there's like millions of little tiny fibers and like a small tear is like like a little kind of frayed piece of the rope to a degree. That's that's yeah. really sort of a good way to look at it. Okay. So at what level then does that become okay, you need to rest this for a while? Because so I would guess in a in a very active sport, you're probably getting those little tears frequently. Sure. But they're not really doing any damage. No, they, they hurt. You kind of, they're stiff after. Oh, yeah. You kind of walk it off. Do they get back in line? Like, do they ever? <laughs> if, that's what I'm picturing in the brain. Muscles heal really well. Anything with yeah. blood heals really well. And that's okay. the big difference between, say, like a joint, like cartilage, and to a lesser degree, ligaments. Mm -hmm. um, cartilage has almost no blood supply. It heals really poorly. Um, muscles have a great blood supply. Bones have an amazing blood supply. They often heal stronger after. So the, the better the blood supply to something, the better it will heal. So muscles heal better than a tendon so you're you're right. better off not that you get the pick but you're better off hurting the muscle than the tendon uh -huh. it'll heal better that way um but the, but that's generally the thing muscles will heal really well as long as you don't keep injuring it and, and cause that that right. tear to to sort of progress then you should be fine they generally heal pretty well so um, just you know a few days off if again, it's mild yeah if it's mild take it easy for a few days yep. some and massage some anti-inflammatory either orally or topically yeah um, when it gets a bit better you can stretch a bit of um, you know ease back into exercise you know if you're a runner you start walking before you run and you know just sort of standard stuff like that mm -hmm. but the, and you can use support um, K tape and bracing um, it all helps but you know once once if it doesn't if it isn't allowed to fully heal it can re-injure itself so it's mm -hmm. definitely something you'll have to watch mm -hmm. okay so I do have a question about ligaments and tendons, which is why do they take so long to heal and what can be done? But we answered that question and now I've learned is because they don't have the same level right. of blood supply. Yeah, blood supply is, is key to, to all things. All things heal better if they have blood supply. So like say teeth have very little blood supply on the, the outside, they don't heal at all. Um, skin has amazing blood supply, it heals amazingly well. It might scar, right. but it heals extremely well. So that's, right. that's the big difference. Cartilage, the inside of a joint, is avascular there's no blood whatsoever they have uh, clear fluid so they um, blood in, in addition to healing it brings nutrients to healthy tissue takes waste away from healthy tissue so joints have to move um, they don't have blood supply so the, the fluid acts like a pump the more it moves the more it kind of flushes itself out and, and keeps the tissue healthy mm -hmm. so every joint in in all people athletes or non-athletes work better if you move the more movement you have the better lubricated the joint the healthier the joint is mm -hmm. So even for somebody who's hurt a joint, which means if they've hurt their joint, they've probably hurt the ligaments and the tendons around the joint. If yep, to a degree, yep. Picking this up properly. So then in order for getting better, they're doing gentle movement. Yep, non-weight bearing, gentle you know, range of motion with you know, non-pain, you know, stop before the point right. of pain because pain is indicating that you're mm -hmm. getting re-injury type situation. So move gently, kind of flush it out. Once you can, you start moving again. Um, and that's really true of all common approaches to injury now even uh, right. like, like like back pain like the you want people up and moving and yes you know if you've ever had anybody you knew that had like a hip replacement they have them up and moving mm -hmm. you know hours after the fact right. so like it's 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 moving is key the more you move the more you heal we're we're right. as as animals we're designed to move we're not designed to sit so injuries then and the healing process for injuries so at this concussion clinic talk to us about time wise like you do a half a day of school and then if you can progress from there and talked about us in time but it's an injury is going to be different for every and, patient. and very every, every patient every injury every and the, the one nice thing is kids you know you don't have to get uh, out of school if you have an ankle injury you can uh, right. you know you can sit there in class with your uh, yeah. ankle wrapped up so yeah. it, it's very dependent I've had kids and kids generally heal pretty quick oh. um, I've had kids with like you know ankle sprains that with treatment you know, you're, you're back in business within like three or four days. And oh, then okay. others, oh, wow. it, it takes okay. longer. Multiple injuries, like when mm -hmm. it's second, certainly third injuries to the same joint, it's gonna take longer because it's, it's, particularly in ligament situations, mm -hmm. once something is damaged, it's very rarely ever right perfectly again. So you can mm -hmm. build up the muscles around the area. Yeah. Um, you, you can brace and stabilize in K-tape and do a bunch of other things. It's probably not ever gonna be, you know, as good as it was before the first injury. Mm -hmm. Where things like muscles, certainly bones, can be stronger. So I'm, I'm gonna sound ridiculous, but K tape is that the colored tape that right. you see like on yeah. the athlete? Okay. Yeah. So you use it the way it's designed to be used. Is it like in in line with the muscles? So it provides a little bit of okay. tension and and sort of supports muscles and. I wasn't ligaments. sure what it yeah. did. Yep, that's no, when I you don't... watch beach volleyball and have those black and blue stripes all yes. over their yeah. shoulders. That's what it's for. Yeah. Yes. So. Yes. 
Um, so one of the questions we had for you is when to use ice and when to use heat. So I'm learning, because you taught us, that ice is a little controversial. Yeah, at, at best it's controversial, yeah. Okay, but what about heat? Is there any time where we should be applying heat? Or so, not applying heat. Or not applying heat. So yeah. generally speaking, in, in sort of, even I'm going to use the old aspect where you would ice something and, and we're kind of getting away from that now, but generally yeah. speaking, anything that was newly hurt, you would use ice and yeah. anything that was chronic, you would use heat. Oh. So heat is generally not used in like any sort of acute sports okay. situation, injury situation. You would use it more for like, like arthritis and back pain and whatever. The one time where you can get away with it is a situation called delayed onset muscle soreness. So delayed onset muscle soreness is the thing where like after your first football practice, and you haven't run all summer, okay. and your legs feel like they've been destroyed, and the stairs, any movement is brutally painful, that's the one time where you can get away with like a hot bath okay. or a hot tub. And every athlete knows Absolutely. that first practice. And there's no way around feeling, it. <laughs> right? Yep. And it's a doozy. That yep, it's off. Sure. So then heat is fine. Other than that, like an acute injury situation, no. 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 Okay. Even though heat feels good. Yeah. Yeah, it's making the inflammation worse, and it's probably to a point where it's no longer beneficial. So. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so I love this word because my son had it and it was brand new to me. What is a foosh? Ha, <laughs> foosh. So it's uh, an acronym for fall on outstretched hand. Yes. So fall on outstretched hand. So it's basically falling where you land with your, your palm uh, down, your fingers splayed out, and your wrist gets bent backwards. Yes. So it's particularly dangerous because there's um, the, the bones that make up your wrist. There are eight bones in your um, wrist called your carpal bones. And one of them, called the scaphoid, is really susceptible to fracture when you have a foosh injury. Um, and the reason that even that is more dangerous again is the bone has like a kind of a figure eight shape and the blood supply comes from one end. So it breaks at the narrow neck and the part that no longer has blood supply dies. Bone, like any other tissue, it needs blood to uh, survive so it can have an avascular situation. So that's, that's where it's really dangerous. So the, there, there are other injuries you can have as well, other fractures, but the, the scaphoid fracture is the big one. That's mm -hmm. where you would have to watch. So mm -hmm. then, then it's like surgery and it's, it's a bit of a problem. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Yes, that, my son had it in both wrists because he um, missed a triple jump and landed on his wrists oh. and didn't tell me for three months that they hurt. Um, but the x-ray showed it was fine and he had to get some ultrasound and, and whatever. But it was, that was a very new thing for me, a foosh. But I love it, actually. Ah, it's a great term. It's a great term. It's a great term. All right, so what happens with shoulders? Like, like... I'm thinking like I hear a lot of rotator cuff. I don't even know what a rotator cuff actually is. Let's be real here. But like shoulder injuries. Sure. What what goes on in the shoulder? So again, very sport specific. Yeah. The rotator cuff, I can tell you very quickly, is four little muscles that supply that support the uh, the the back, really the back area of the shoulder. Um, they're they're stabilizing muscles. Um, the reason they're often injured is that they, the shoulder's a real balanced situation. The, the, the socket that it sits in is really shallow. And the reason that it sits in there at all is because the muscles pull evenly all around it. And if it doesn't, they, you get an imbalanced situation and you can have damage to the muscle. And those are the muscles that get over, overworked and overstretched and often injured. So in throwing situations, oh, okay. the, um, the, the rotator cuff gets sort of tethered and damaged uh, at the top and it becomes painful. So that's, that's a really common one. Um, in contact sports, football and hockey, you tend to have separated shoulders where the, the, the yes. joint at the top of yes. the shoulder gets kind of sheared, gets damaged frequently. That's a really common one. Um, and then muscle tears and you know, that sort of thing. But th those are probably the main ones, I guess. And then the, obviously a dislocation if you're in a situation where the shoulder pops right out. Right. But, Horrific. No. Yeah. Whoa. Not fun. Not fun. I don't even want to think about it. No. No. Okay, so if you were gonna, if you were gonna say and I don't know if you can even make this claim, but just in general, high school sports, what would be probably the most common injury? Boy, for all high school sports, that's... It's just a general. Can you even make that claim or no? It's so tricky because you get so many different injuries in different sports. I guess probably ankle sprain. Yeah. I, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, I could cover most may, sports. Maybe a knee yeah. sprain. Mm -hmm. um, but like in hockey, both of those are really uncommon. Okay. Um, in hockey, it's, it's shoulder injuries, concussion, yeah. um, rib injuries, oh. Um, oh, hip, back. You know what I mean? Like those are yeah. way more common than, yeah. than uh, knee to a degree, but like you rarely see ankle injuries in sports. So, mm -hmm. and sorry, in, in hockey. In hockey. Yeah. So it, it's it's very sport specific. Right. Like in, okay. in in volleyball, you're not going to get a lot of concussion in uh, 
you know what I mean? In, in right. basketball, you're going to see a ton of ankle and yes. um, knee injuries. So, yeah, it's very sport specific. If I, if I had to guess, I would say probably, you know, ankle sprain. Yeah. Yeah. And so what what is the value, um, is there a value in athletes wearing an actual brace, like a, a, an ankle brace, an actual knee? Like I see a lot of knee braces. Some of them are very like futuristic looking, mm -hmm. like very heavy mm -hmm. duty. Others are just like the... The compression. Like a so compression right. sleeve. That's what I'm, like yeah. that kind of brace. So there's, I see varying degrees, but... So the sleeve isn't providing a ton of support. It's more just keeping okay. the muscles warm and, and warm tissue is less likely to get injured than cold. So okay. that's, that has okay. a benefit. Um, but generally speaking, you would never wear a brace until you had an injury. And then a brace would just protect that area when you're you're returning to sport after the, the injury. Uh -huh. You would very rarely... I can't think of a reason why you would wear a brace beforehand. It's just, it's just. So you shouldn't decide. just decide. No, because be you're you're brace. way better off to strengthen the area and, and make okay. the, the tissue itself strong. Braces over time can actually weaken the Ooh. area if you're okay. kind of using them as a crutch almost. Right, that makes um, sense. So yeah, you would you would very rarely ever think of a brace uh, unless you were injured. Okay. So, yeah, the other brace just in terms of knees, you get a condition called Osgood Schlatter's where the, the tendon starts to pull away from the bone oh. below the knee. So that's the brace that you see that's just like a little uh, like a little strap almost. Oh, yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So in, yes. in jumping sports, that's really common. So if you yes, see, if you ever go to volleyball, basketball, basketball yes. for sure you'll see kids wearing those. So that's, yeah. a, that's a pretty common injury as well. Okay. And that's so it's and just would a you be told to wear that? Yeah, you once, once you have that, you're, you're oh, okay. basically wearing that every time you can compete until you're oh, an adult. Okay. Okay, which brings me to that same type of like band kind of brace. Like I see people wear that like on their middle arm. Yeah, so that What's might that be. One for? So that might be just because you think it's cool, okay, or it might enough. be it might be because you have a bit of tendonitis in the oh, okay. the, the elbow, or you've had and you want to prevent it. Because uh -huh. um, again, oh, warm okay. tissues and, and the, the compression provides a little bit of support, not a ton, but a little. So it might help an injury from coming back. Um, in in a sport like. Oh, like tennis, where you're using right. the, the forearm a ton, you yeah. might throw that on as a preventative thing. Um, my son wore one when he played football. I don't know. I think he thought it was cool. Yeah. Uh, he never had an injury to it <laughs> before or after. He just Whatever. I don't know. It looked cool. Yeah. Looked Sometimes good. I think I think athletes are just wearing K tape. Just, yeah. It was a good yes. chance for me to spend money, so I think he's happy <laughs> with that. So. Teenagers. Mm. Oh, oh my gosh. Okay. That is kind of all the questions that we had. Is there anything that you wanted to add that we didn't get to that you think is worth mentioning? No, I mean, just that, you know, it's important. I know the, the guys with concussion were talking about, you know, err on the side of caution. That's yes. always a good idea. So if, you're, if your kid is injured and you're worried, take them to the hospital, take them to a chiropractor, take them to the doctor, um, listen to what they say, you know, make sure that, you know, you're putting safety first. Not, nothing that these kids are playing is worth Right. damaging yourself for right so like i said if it's a minor injury they can probably you listen to the athlete let them go if they think they're up for it but you know if you're at all concerned get it checked out get an x-ray make sure it's you know not something serious mm -hmm. yeah because you don't want it to turn into right. anything serious yep. right exactly yeah all right well thank you so much that we, again we learned a lot we really did in yeah. such a short period of time. You know what? We are university educated people. <laughs> yes. <laughs> There's just so much we don't know. Right? That's but why you bring in people to do, right? Why that's why we're do. doing what we do. That's right. And Kelly and I want everyone to know it's okay to say we don't know. Yeah. And we need Absolutely. To learn. And ask and learn and listen. And ask and, and learn and listen. Yeah. Absolutely. So thank you so much. And um, I look forward to seeing you in the chiropractor office because <laughs> Raquel has a bad back. So anyway, Excellent. take care. Thank, Thank you for so having much. me. Bye. Awesome. Thank you so much. Continuing with our episode on sports injuries and concussions, we're joined by two athletes. Um, we have Cooper McCauley and Callum Peterson here with us, both of who um, suffered injury and concussion this season and cut their season short. So we're going to start with Callum, and we're just going to get you to kind of paint us a story of what happened, what your injury was, and your healing, and you can just take it away. All right, perfect. So uh, my name is Callum. I'm a Superior Heights athlete. Um, I got a pretty bad injury to my ankle uh, and my leg when I was playing football. I was playing against White Pines. Uh, there was a fumble, so I picked up the fumble and I started running in my head. I was like, this is perfect. I'm going to get a pick six, get on a highlight reel. Uh, somebody tackled my leg, basically, and it was just like a weird tackle. Uh, my foot was kind of planted in the ground and I got tackled from the side and my ankle basically rotated 90 degrees to the right. 
Um, and so basically a dislocated ankle, uh, broke the ankle as well, um, broke my leg, and then I also, it also destroyed all the ligaments supporting my ankle, which was like probably the worst part of the injury, okay. were the damaged ligaments. And we know that. Yes. <laughs> because Dr. Scott just told us it's because of the lack of blood supply. Yeah. So look exactly. at us putting this all together. So all of that happened from one tackle. From one tackle, yeah. And instantly. 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 Uh, when it first happened, I was on the ground. Uh, I dropped the fumble, and my first thought was, like, this isn't good. My coaches are going to be mad. You know, like, I got to yeah. get up, grab this ball, or do something. And when I uh, tried to get up, I didn't even move, and I knew that, like, something was wrong. I couldn't get up. And I turned around and looked, and, like, the first thing I saw was my ankle just facing the completely wrong way. Oh, my gosh. So that was pretty uh, pretty scary seeing that yes. first. Yes. Um, but I think, like, I was – I saw it. I uh, – it was like scary, but then like I just had to like there was nothing I could really have done, so I just laid down. I tried to like I was just breathing, taking deep breaths, you know, trying to calm down. Um, and then like in an instant, all the coaches from both teams, all the staff from both teams were like all around me supporting me. So it was nice, you know, to see uh, all those guys. They all know what like relatively injuries uh, mm -hmm, right. throughout football, so they all have like some understanding of what to do, mm -hmm. which was like very helpful. Mm -hmm. When did you feel pain? Um. I felt pain when I saw it. Okay. Oh, isn't that interesting? Yeah, so yeah. at first it was numb. I didn't feel anything. Right. Okay. Uh, and then I saw it, and then that was like kind of like set it off. And then yeah. uh, as, it, like, as it started swelling right there, it started to hurt more. Okay. So I was like, it was almost like you could feel it expanding right. just from the swelling. Yeah. So the instant that it happened, you, I had no idea. You had no idea it actually happened in that moment. No. So between the point where you saw it, like, are we just talking like just a few seconds? Like so? seconds. Yeah. Like tried to get up, and then I was like, this doesn't seem good. So I turned around on my back and I looked, and I held my leg up to look, and yeah. I was just, and then you're, that's not what I wanted to see. No. No. No, that was not what you wanted to see. No. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And then the ambulance is called. Ambulance is called. Everybody claims it took a long time. It uh, did. To me, it didn't, in the stands, it, did, but. it didn't feel as long. I was just talking to the coaches. Okay. Uh, I was just really just focusing on like staying calm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, um, I just, I think I handled it pretty well. I think uh, I was like cracking jokes with the coaches. Like I was just trying to not make it worse than it already was. Right. And then what happened when you got to the hospital? Uh, when I got to the hospital, uh, there was a dreadful ambulance ride to the hospital. I'd say that was pretty bad, but when I got to the hospital, I was brought into a room. Um, basically, I was there for maybe 10 minutes, and then they knocked me out and relocated my ankle was oh, the first thing okay. that they did. Okay. Uh, and then I got the cast, and then that was really it for the night. Uh, I ate that night, but then there wasn't a lot of eating in the hospital because you can't eat right. for a certain amount of time before a surgery, mm -hmm. and they knew this was going to require surgery. Okay. So I ate what I could, when I could, yes. and then after that I was brought to the uh, the kids section of the uh, hospital, and I stayed the night there, and then um, we were waiting on surgery, but like there's a priority for surgery, so if somebody comes in with something more important, then they gotta see to that first. Uh, so I was there for two nights, pretty well three days, waiting to get surgery, and I would say that was the worst part of the entire oh. injury was just sitting in that hotel bed, not being able to move, just. So you couldn't eat? Uh, could, I didn't eat for like oh the entire gosh. days because they didn't know if I was gonna have surgery oh or not. Uh, so I just had this IV in my arm for like three wow. days. How miserable were you? It was, that was, that was by the far the mentally, the worst part yeah. of my entire injury was being yeah. in the hospital for yeah. that whole time. So it took three days for you to get the surgery. Yeah. And then once you had the surgery, was then you just like, okay, surgery's done, you're going home? Yeah, pretty well. So they keep you a little bit just to uh, monitor you, yeah. make sure everything's going well. Uh, I think it's only like maybe an hour, two hours that they keep you there. And then I was discharged. Mm -hmm. um, my mom brought me home. We got some good food to eat. Mm -hmm. That was pretty nice. good. Okay. Uh, yeah. And got home, uh, got a new gaming console as, as, a, as a recovery Valor. gift. <laughs> yeah. So I set that up and that was my uh, best friend throughout my recovery. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Okay, so we're gonna we'll come back to you. Okay. Um, hang tight. Hang tight. <laughs> All right. So now we are going to move over to Cooper McCauley, and Cooper has had a concussion. Yeah. 
So, and so let's tell us about what happened and how it happened. Okay. So my name's Cooper. Um, my I'm also a Superior Heights athlete. My injury was also during the football season, and it was in our third game against Cora, and we had to punt the ball. So I was running down to go make a big tackle on the like on the play, but he dropped it, and I had to give or he didn't catch it. So I had to give him five yards to pick up the ball, and that allowed somebody to set up behind me and blindside me. And as I was falling for that, another player came in and drove his knee right into my head. Oh my. And it just knocked me out cold. And I was just on the ground out cold. Oh, so you were actually knocked out. So I was knocked out for maybe about like a minute. And then I kind of woke up and tried to stand up and I fell back over. And then that's kind of when the coaches started to come over to me. And yeah, so. And how did your, like, how did you feel in that moment? Like, did you feel nauseous? Um, did you feel dizzy? Did, like, I'm trying to think of this. Did you feel pain? Yeah. Did you feel like I didn't even know sore? where I was. Oh, like, I had a you, crazy you were... pain in my head. Okay. I was, the, the whole world was spinning. Um, I could, like, see stars. It was pretty bad. Okay, so a lot of those symptoms that the concussion clinic has a checklist for, which we just learned about, and you would be very familiar with the concussion <laughs> clinic. Yeah. You I'm, had, it sounds like you had quite a few of the symptoms. I'm pretty sure I had almost all of the and symptoms. And immediately, yeah. 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 So were you able to walk yourself off the field? Um, I wasn't able to walk myself. I had my dad and one of my coaches carry me into the locker room. And if I'm being completely honest, I don't remember much of it. This is oh. kind of what I was told because I don't really remember anything from that. Okay. I remember like a few plays during the game and that's mostly just from watching the film from the game. Wow. But wow. so I went to the locker room and they have a little table in there. So they kind of laid me down on the table and I was just out. And then I do remember being put under a shower with cold water to try and relieve some of the pain from my head. In that locker room? Yeah, in the locker oh, okay. room. And then from there, did you go to the hospital? Yeah, they didn't call an ambulance, so I just had to get helped into my truck and laid down in the back seat, and we went right to the hospital. Okay, and what did they do when you got to the hospital? Um, in or do the, you remember? <laughs> <laughs> what the, have you been told? <laughs> I was just kind of, they put me in the, like a wheelchair and I had to wait for my number to be called at the hospital and I was just kind of sitting there. I don't think my eyes were even opened because oh the light was hurting my head yeah. too much. I couldn't even keep my eyes open. And then they called my number and my dad was parking the truck so he wasn't even in there. So somebody wheeled me into the room and I kind of just talked to the person that was asking me what happened I just told her it was with my head I have another concussion because I had previous concussions and then I had to go and wait in a little room for probably four hours before an actual doctor came in to talk oh. to me okay um but once the doctor comes in like you can't really do much with a concussion they kind of just tell you dark room stay off your phone like that kind of stuff to help you heal for the first bit but he did recommend going to the concussion clinic which i went to okay oh my goodness both of you have been through a lot and hats off to both of you for being so resilient because it's not easy yeah. um okay so i'm gonna ask both of you this question but i'm gonna go back to callum first so what has the healing journey been like for you because this was not right. a fast process to not heal. at all no um so I was first told uh, no weight bearing on my ankle for like a minimum of two months, so eight weeks. Uh, and like you hear that and that's kind of just like, a, it's a little bit demoralizing because like, yeah. it's a long time yeah. to not be walking. Uh, so I got home, I had a little scooter that you put your knee on yeah. and you ride yeah. around. Yeah. That was my transportation for probably the two months at home. Um, and then outside of the house, I just used crutches. Uh, crutches were brutal. They crutches hurt. Brutal. They're uncomfortable. Yeah. They're, they're exhausting. Really hard under, like, this, like, yep. under, under your arms, like how much it hurts. Yep. I had uh, like I would have calluses on my yeah. hands. Yeah. Uh, there was definitely like friction rubbing on mm -hmm. my like chest. Yep. My armpit. So that wasn't pleasant. 
Not really. Uh, and did you have a cast like below your knee? Right. Yeah. So, so you I had did. That mobility still in your knee. I so did have the mobility in my knee, which was Thankfully. huge. Thankfully, I had that. Um, I just when when I look back on it, I remember like whenever I had to clean myself, I would have to like sit yeah. on a stool in the bathtub oh, with my leg hanging out yeah. of the bathtub in a garbage bag, taped around my uh, my thigh, and then. Uh, yeah, it was just a lot of crutching around. Luckily, my friends were all like uh, super supportive. They helped me a lot mm-hmm. when I was like at school and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Uh, you didn't miss two months of school, did you? No, I only missed a week. Oh, okay. Yeah, I only missed a week at school. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, at what point did you get your cast off? Uh, so, I got my first cast off um, after those two... I want to say no, maybe not. Maybe like a month or so in, I got an air boot, um, so I could take it off. I could clean my leg, which was huge. I was very happy when I got that. Uh, It is funny because I have big feet, so they had to get the biggest one they had, so it looked like I had a stormtrooper boot for like a month. Um, Really big. It was like bulky and it wasn't nice, but. But better than the cast. Better than the cast. Uh, the the whole time I was in the cast, I had to wear like these these big baggy yes. pajamas just so they would fit over. Yeah. Once I got the air boot, you know, I could clean it. I could wear like a, change my socks. Yeah. I could uh, put pants on and just put the boot over top of the Didn't pants. Did that experience make you realize how many little everyday things yes. you take for granted? It was very eye opening. Yes. Uh, super super eye opening. Yeah. So the boot, so the cast to the boot, and then eventually, okay, Callum no boot you're good to try and walk how long was that whole process right so uh two months in i got the go ahead to start bearing some weight on it okay. but obviously you can't just go no go walk in no. for the first no. time so I, ha- I was still walking with uh support from crutches yeah. um so i would put my foot down and then my crutches down at the same time just yeah. so it's not too much weight i think i did that for about two weeks um around the house I would like walk around because it's just you know you're it's not a lot of walking so i have to go to the bathroom or go to the Mm -hmm. kitchen it's it's not a lot but uh definitely for school Mm -hmm. i had the i had the crutches if i went out somewhere i'd bring the crutches um after those two weeks i was good to start walking it was it wasn't like it wasn't the same it wasn't just like i went back to walking normally it was like still painful to walk but uh it it sped up pretty quick. I started doing physio right when I got the, okay, the yeah. go-ahead to uh, start walking without crutches and mm-hmm. whatnot. Mm-hmm. So, that's so it good. was a long process. It was a super long process, definitely. Wow. And it's uh, like still going. I'm not even done. Like I still have a couple more months of physio before I get back into like uh, full competitive sports. Right. Uh, right now, I'm just, I've been on the ice a couple times recently. Uh, with my hockey team, which has been huge. Uh, definitely miss not being on the ice for the season, I but I've been getting out for some practices. It's been really good. Mm-hmm. Wow. All right. Yeah. So, Cooper, what has your healing journey been like? Um, for the first week, I was pretty much just in my room in the dark the whole time. Oh. Couldn't really do anything. It's Concussion is probably one of the most boring like recoveries because you cannot do anything. Um, And then after that first week, I was able to go back to school, but I would only do half days. So I'd go for my morning classes and the next day I'd go for my afternoon classes. And I did that for about a week and a half until I was finally ready to do a full day. And during that whole time, my head was still like pounding and I couldn't really look at the lights. So I just have to wear my hood at school the whole time. And then I had like, so at the like concussion clinic we'd rate our headaches or like your head pain from a scale to one to ten ten being the worst and one being like nothing really so i'd have level nine eight ten like headaches every day and it's you giving that number yeah and it's me giving that number but so that like i had that every day for probably three weeks Mm -hmm. after i was able to do full days of school and then it would slowly start going down but probably two, maybe almost three months of just constant headaches. Like, I don't oh. think it stopped once. Yeah. But I did get rid of most symptoms other than, like, light sensitivity and headaches. And those ones lasted for about two to three months. Wow. 
So that was that, that was a very bad concussion you had. It, it was pretty bad. Yeah. It could have been worse, but I, it was pretty bad. It was pretty bad, yeah. So where are you both now? So Calum, you sort of said you're not there yet, but you're, be, you're getting there. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, basically my physiotherapist brought me through how it should look coming back to sports. Yep. Uh, he brought me through, so he said, start uh, going on the ice, just skating around, doing your own thing. Uh, don't do drills right away. Uh, just see how everything feels, stopping, pivoting, uh, whatnot. And then when I got on the ice, I thought that it would felt perfect, like not perfectly good, but pretty good, like better than I thought it was going to be. Um, so then my second time on the ice, I started doing the easier drills that are more like uh, by yourself, not relying like on compete drills. Mm -hmm. So just skating, shooting. Uh, today I was on the ice, I was doing almost all the drills that we were doing. Uh, so what I'm really noticing is how much I improve. Like every time I go on the ice, it's better every time. Right. Um, so that's been really good. I've been uh pretty like i go to the gym yep um so i'd say running is the main thing my uh, physiotherapist said that like will not be will not be done for a while just okay. because it's so much pressure because yep. uh, i have screws on my ankle i have four screws okay um they they plan on keeping them in they're oh. not they don't intend on taking them out okay. if they were to poke out or cause problems oh, then they would gracious. take okay. them out mm -hmm. uh it's normal for them to break uh, as long as you're, it's everything's healing fine. So I have one broken screw. Okay. Um, my surgeon said that that's completely normal. You just keep it there. Um, so running, maybe not for a little bit longer, but I'm definitely skating. I'm mm -hmm. um, doing some, just like workouts for my ankle. Yeah. And that's yeah. all been going pretty good. It's steadily improving. Good. Yeah. And one of the things with a broken leg is, yes, you have the ankle injury. Mm -hmm. But then you also have the muscle atrophy that has happened. Yes. Right? Like yeah. you end up with like a stick leg. Yeah. And you have to rebuild all of that muscle. That was. And that takes time too, right? They're very weak. That was pretty brutal. I, I think I lost almost like 10 pounds of just muscle, muscle. in my leg. Yeah. Uh, and it was visible. I think that was like a, one of the worst things was seeing my leg <laughs> almost shrink yeah. throughout the time. Yeah. Um, like it was visible. There was a difference between the two legs. I think I'm. I'm getting pretty like close to being back oh, to normal by now though. Yeah. 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 Have you forgotten in your journey and Cooper this question for you to where you're at with your healing like have you been like oh I'm just going to run today and forget everything that's going on or, or are was you it so traumatic or was you'll, it, never forget. you'll never forget oh, and you're nervous to even just walk. I think sometimes uh well while, while I was injured sometimes I would just wake up and think that I can just start walking just around. Just get out of bed and you know yeah. but obviously you couldn't. Right. Uh now it's just like I feel good. I probably I would love to go for a run. Yeah. Not that I'm that much into running. I don't think I can run very far, but right. I would love to go for a run if yeah. I was able to. Mm -hmm. uh, but it will come. I just have to be patient. It will. That's right. Yeah, yep. that's right. Yeah. Yep. And sure. Cooper, where are you? Is your concussion healed? Are you considered healed now? Yes, my concussion is fully healed and I'm back to normal. The only thing that kind of stuck with me is I will still get like random migraines, oh. which I never used to get before. So I'm. I think that it's because of the concussion, because I never got them before, right. but it's happens now, so I'll just get random ones every once in a while. Okay, but you are considered to be healed. Yeah, I can Good. go back to any contact sport, play any sport again. Were you cleared during the football season? I was not I cleared during remember. the football season. You so you lost the season. Yeah, I would try to you let. Lost the season. I would try to get my coaches to let me play, but they wouldn't let me play. Uh, coaches did the right thing. Yeah. <laughs> coaches did the right thing. Yeah. So I have a question for both of you, and, and we're already running out of time. But how is this experience on you mentally? We know physically what your symptoms were and how you felt, right? But the mental drain that goes with an injury and the recovery, and Cooper, you alluded to how boring it was, right? And the frustration and all of that. So how is this process on you mentally? Um, I would say mentally, it was like, it was pretty tiring. Yeah. You know, every day, like uh, knowing that like you're, I don't know if I can really use this word, handicapped in a way, like you can't, you can't do things that you would normally be able right. to do. Yeah. Uh, and it's definitely hard. Uh, you see people like you see people on your teams who are still doing what they're able to do and you don't you don't envy them But you're just like you wish you could be there with them yeah. um, 
but I would say the most important thing was just like no accepting it, knowing that it happened, knowing that it's not going to change overnight. It's going to take a while, and as soon as you accept that, I think it's almost easier to cope with. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think it's really just important to accept it and mm-hmm. just deal with it. Yeah, but yeah. there's a mental game with it for sure. Yeah, there's definitely because a mental game with it. It's very hard mentally to yeah. be to be that. And Cooper, you did you talked about the boredom, mm-hmm. but what else? Sort of what? How hard was this on you mentally? Um, mentally, it was pretty hard, especially like even just being so like what Callum said, exhausted all the time. Yeah. Like even just walking around school, I'd be exhausted for the next like three days. Oh, wow. But also, it, like it hurt mentally watching your team keep playing when you're not playing anymore, and when they lose, or when they lose in the semis or whatever, and you don't get to like help try and win. Right. You don't get to do your part on the team. You have to kind of watch from the sidelines, yeah. knowing that you could have been out there if one little thing didn't happen. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It is. It's really mentally it's tough. Hard. To yeah. deal. It's physically tough and it's mentally tough. So Definitely. hats off to both of you for getting through it because it's not easy. Um, I can't believe that we didn't even get to all the questions no, we, we didn't. had I'm because looking. we yeah. just didn't. So we need to, we need to go to shoutouts. Okay. That's how we end. So we always ask for athletes to end with a shout out to somebody who has supported them. Um, we always say supported you in your sport, which you can still absolutely do. You are both multi-sport athletes, but it could be somebody that supported you through what you went through, right? So it's really up to you and feel free to give a shout out to more than one person. <laughs> All right. Go right ahead. Uh, sports wise, I would probably give a shout out to our head coach, Mr. DeSando. Uh, I've built a pretty good relationship with him. I have, he's been my teacher before. Mm-hmm. Uh, every time he'd see me, he would ask me if I was like how I was doing. You know, he'd uh, just like be there. All the teachers were super supportive, and like all our school staff. And then for uh, basically the healing part of the journey, my parents had a planned trip to Greece for their 25th anniversary, and they were supposed to leave like the the next day that my oh. injury take, took place. So they postponed their trip for a couple more days, and then they still had to go on it. There was too much commitment already to just cancel it. And my uh, sister's boyfriend, who lives in Toronto, actually came to our house and basically took care of me for like oh. the whole week they were gone. So I, nice. I would be wrong to not give a shout yes. out to him. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Good job. For sure. All right, Cooper. Uh, I would definitely give a shout out to one of the coaches at Superior on the football team, Coach Joe. Um, every day at practice, he would talk to me make sure I was doing okay like when I was practicing and not able to play Mm -hmm. and during the whole injury he was the one coach that was with me the whole time in the locker room when I went down brought me out to like my car before I went to the hospital and yeah he just kind of stuck with me at practice after afterwards and just made sure I was okay and everything and also like what Callum said the teachers at Superior were very nice and like like with my injury I had some little rules and stuff from the clinic and they were all completely okay with it with like testing and right. other assignments because your injury would impact your academics yeah a lot more than i'm not yeah. saying it didn't impact oh, the school environment but like certainly the concussion is gonna have a really big impact there. yeah the teachers were very supportive with that and all my assignments and my tests and everything good all right. Well, thank you to both of you for thank you. reliving your yes. trauma. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I can't imagine what my face looked like during oh some of the... <laughs> um, it really sounds like both of you handled this very well, as much as it was awful. And really maturely. And really maturely. Yeah. And you showed a lot Good of job, guys. Um, back on the field in September. That was my Possibly. next question. Yeah. Possibly. That's, I think, a great way to end, right? Do you... Callum, you're possibly. I'm possibly. I'm, what do you think? I'm definitely going to be back on the field. And I plan on being the, on the field in the summertime playing on Sioux Saber Cats. Okay. Best of luck. Well, we wish you awesome, awesome recovery. Your last kind of every, bit of everything. Cooper, I hope those bad headaches do go away. And then you can honestly say you had a complete recovery. Um, Callum, I hope things continue to go well. Thank and you. we look forward to seeing you guys on the on the field, on the rink, on the, wherever. Wherever right? you will wherever be. Wherever you want to be. I hope that you get there soon. Thanks awesome. for joining us, guys. Thank Thanks, you. guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you.